one of my friends gave me a whole bunch of audiobooks just to listen to. And, and it also opened my mind to, Rachel, see, you can be happy. You can be do all these things if you, if you leave. you can. There is real life. There are good people. And I don't know, that helped me and my sisters remember that there really is such thing as being happy and doing things that you want to do. And it gave us that courage to want to leave. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt. Terry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey Dr. O. Brandon Sanders. Robin Hawk. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Rachel Jeffs. It's episode 261 of the Author Stories Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. We hope you're enjoying all of the great podcasts we've been bringing you lately. We try, we really strive to bring you a broad mix of different genres and authors from every spectrum because as creative people, I believe we really need uh, to pay attention uh, to other things and think outside the box. And so I hope that you enjoy the great mix that we bring. And as part of that mix, uh, today I'm bringing you a show with Rachel Jeffs. Uh, some of you may remember a few years ago that this story was in the news quite a bit. And I remember watching uh, this uh, FLDS cult uh, as it was uh, being infiltrated and Warren Jeffs, the leader, was arrested and... Uh, I never imagined that one day I would be getting to speak uh, to someone so closely connected to the situation. Today, Rachel Jeffs, Warren Jeffs' daughter, is with me. She just released a brand new book yesterday all about her experience in coming out of uh, this cult. And uh, we're really excited and really privileged to have her on the show. She's been doing some major national press uh, television today show, Dateline NBC, all sorts of things. And uh, her publisher asked us to have her on as well. So we're very proud to have Rachel on the show today, and I hope you enjoy uh, the show. I'd like to thank our sponsors for making this possible, thirdscribe.com, authors, readers. Thirdscribe is there to connect you together. It's one of the very best platforms uh, built specifically around books and readers. Go visit thirdscribe.com today. Tales from the Canyons of the Damned, episode 20 is out. It's Tales uh, from Space, one of my very favorite monthly publications full of pulpy goodness. Go pick up Tales from the Canyons of the Damned, episode 20. Also, brand new, uh, just out last week, Tales of Dystopia. This collection of dystopian tales uh, feature stories uh, that include an animal that, that is a significant part of the story, and it really breaks down the relationship between humans, animals, in uh, these precarious positions. And uh, the proceeds from this show, uh, some of the proceeds go to Pets for Vets, one of our favorite charities that helps uh, team up animals uh, that are in shelters with uh, veterans that come back. Uh, So this is a a worthy and a worthwhile uh, project and an organization that we're benefiting. So go pick up a copy of Tales of dystopia today. Also, at the end of the show, we're going to have a clip from Richard Glebe's The Jason Crane Series, so stick around at the end. Thanks so much for listening. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Uh, today, I'm really excited to have a very special guest with me on the show, Rachel Jeffs. Uh, Rachel has a brand new book out uh, November 14th when we're recording this. It's called Breaking Free, How I Escaped Polygamy, the FLDS Cult, and my father, Warren Jeffs. Uh, welcome to the show, Rachel. Thank you. Uh, Rachel, I know that uh, that everyone is asking uh, probably the same questions and, and really trying to you know figure out your story. But you know this podcast is all about storytelling, and this book is captivating and a, a really uh, gripping read. I, I begin each show with the same question, and that question is: What is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or a storyteller? When I was in eighth grade, my teacher was a really good writer, and 
she made me want to write. I mean, I loved her, the story she'd write, and she really encouraged us as students to be creative writers. And so it, it was important to me to be a creative writer. At first, you know, I thought I tried to use big words and stuff, and then I realized, you know what, writing how we talk is, is really the best creative writing, just how we think and talk. And and it made her life exactly. Um, so it was it was important to you early on to to really find your voice as a storyteller. Yeah, yeah. And so I and I enjoyed it, and and it made me think, hey, I, hey, I want to be a writer. You know, I really love writing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so for the for the three people out there that have not kind of heard the story of the the FLDS and uh, and you your father uh the the founder and 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 kind of um uh ruler uh, for lack of a better word of this organization um tell everybody just a little bit about your history and 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 how you you came to be uh where you were i'm um, growing up i mean i was born and raised in the flds church you know they have really strict rules morals like really i mean even all the sexual abuse is against their teachings we were taught to keep our bodies covered and boys don't look at girls or touch girls and girls don't look at boys and touch boys we were taught to be morally clean is what they called it um so most of the people there really really are quite honest and morally good people but behind the scenes the rulers i mean at least my dad Warren Jeff he 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 went against his own teachings and was sexually abusive to women and girls. And and that was, I mean, but it's not like everyone was that way. It was just kind of like rulers that get so much authority, they feel like they can do anything. Right. So what are, like, um, what is the difference in the FLDS and what, uh, what many of us know is a very mainstream LDS? Uh, what what separates the FLDS? A lot, a lot of things. Like the FLDS believes in the fundamental teachings of Joseph Smith and polygamy, and they believe that women and men should keep their bodies covered and not go undressed. And they like from their necks to their wrists to their ankles, um, they should keep their bodies covered all the time, even when they're swimming. Everyone, they just have, they believe that revelation comes to their prophet and they have to do whatever he says. They're taught that the leader or the prophet of the church cannot do wrong at all, that he's next to God and anything he says they must obey and they they can never talk against him. Wow. Um so you were you were born there. You you never knew anything different. No, I I didn't know anything different and and you know we were taught that the world was wicked and and I honestly believed that they were, you know. I thought there were no good people out here and that they were all just terrible people because that's how we were taught. And and as I got older, I realized, you know what, there are good people out here. There are people that are kind and loving and want to do, you know, be good people. Right. Um, you know, we focus uh, on storytelling uh, here and the, the power of, of story to really change the way people uh, think and, and, and believe and, and how we interact with one another. Um, that, that teacher that you had that encouraged you to, uh, to, to write and uh, it, it, well, first off, what sorts of things uh, did you read as, as a kid? Did you have access to um, you know, to a, a full open library like we would think today, or, or were they very no, carefully no, selected? I, there was books. Um, like we had to sneak all the novel. I mean, like we were told to only read scripture, you know. So I would sneak. There was a library in the school, but we weren't allowed to read any of the books. It was like an old library, and so my father and Jess told us we could not get the books out of there. But it was there, but and it was supposed to stay locked. But we would. Me and my sisters would sneak in there and go get books, and then we'd stay in the bathroom and read all day because that was the only place we could have the door locked. <laughs> and so we would. I, I read a lot of books. I, I would mostly because there wasn't so much available, but I read a lot of like animal stories, and I, I liked I liked romance stories, but I I didn't 
wasn't able to read very many and you know, on different stories like that I really enjoyed but I just had to sneak to read for the most part what what was that uh, uh, what was that feeling like uh, to know that you were reading stories about people and and situations outside of your group um, you, you know did you did you feel it made me wish you know that oh that would be so neat if I could do that or live that way or be free and do what I wanted you know I, I, I did I thought about that a lot it it was it was a good for me to see another light you know right right um do you feel like that that well first off how old were you when when you started sneaking books i i probably from the time i could read like when i was 6 clear up until um i was 15 and then it pretty much there was just no available books after that any no way to even sneak a book after that so I, it was only between those years, I was actually able to read any kind of novels or any kind of regular books. So, so reading kind of painted uh, another world for you. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, I I would imagine um, that in a uh, such an authoritarian uh, environment, uh, the the reason that you're f- forbidden from reading things uh, is that. Uh, they don't want you to kind of imagine what life would be like on the outside. It's, it's exactly. very important to, um, to always believe that the people out there are bad and we are good. Um, mm-hmm. what, at what point did, did it start cracking for you? Did you, uh, at what point did you start realizing that you wanted to leave? Um, after, well, I knew, so I knew that, father wasn't a good man I mean and so I always knew that but after what really gave me the strength was after he started being stricter and stricter on our rules and taking took my kids away from me and made me live alone and felt like he was trying to break me down and so that's when I just thought I'm not going to live this way anymore I'm going to leave and also what helped me is uh, one of my friends gave me a whole bunch of audiobooks just you know, what we called Gentile stories because we considered everyone Gentile. <laughs> anyway, she gave me a whole bunch of audio books to listen to, and, and it also opened my mind to, Rachel, see, you can be happy, you can be do all these things. If you, if you leave, You can. there is real life, there are good people. And I don't know, that helped me and my sisters remember that there really is such thing as being happy and doing things that you want to do and it gave us that courage to want to leave so so someone was giving you audiobooks while you were still inside someone's not a friend because i i really had to sneak to even see anybody and i had met this girl and she became my friend she was also in the church but one of her brothers outside of the church had given her a bunch of audiobooks and she let me take them and listen to them what were some of those audiobooks that uh, kind of opened you up? They, they were they were older ones, I think. I mean, like, let me think. <laughs> um, I'm trying to remember. <laughs> now I can't think of. Them. What like what 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 sort of genre were they? Were they romance? Were they? Um, it, it, yeah, a lot of them were romance. Um, a lot of them were like stories of heroes coming and saving people and stuff like that you know um i wish i could remember one but it I, they're not coming to mind but yeah, yeah. well this the the fact i uh, well first you talked about uh your father taking your children away um you were um you had an arranged marriage uh in yeah. inside the uh so i would i would imagine when when you're told who you, who you're going to marry and uh and, and you have children and of course you love your children because you're they're yours, but, um, you know, they're, they're a product of this, you know, relationship that you didn't choose. Uh, I would imagine that, that hearing stories and reading stories of, of people that, that pursue happiness on their own, uh, has to do something to you and, and really, uh, make you long for that freedom. Oh, very much. It makes you want to experience that, that happiness and that freedom. It just, you, you want to just see what that would be like. Um, so when you when you decided that you're going to leave, um, how how do you go about getting out of of this place? Were were there people on the outside that helped you escape, or um, like how did you get out? 
No, you know, I mean, not necessarily. Um, we kind of, me and my sisters just decided we were going to go, and I helped them get hold of our grandparents and uncle that was outside of the church. And he he helped them get out, and then because I wanted to see if I could talk to my husband, because I wanted him to leave with me, but he wouldn't ever talk to me. So then I they came and got snuck and got me, and and yeah, we had to be really sneaky, you know, because the church authorities were constantly guarding us and watching us and making sure we we're doing what our father told us to do, and so. You know, we had to sneak out late at night, and they followed us. You know, they tried hard to get us to come back and kept bringing messages from Father that we were going to lose our salvation, that we were making our children lose their salvation. and If we didn't come back, we would never be happy and all kinds of stuff like that. Wow. Um, inside the um, uh, the the FLDS, uh, do do people work jobs? Uh, like, is there any communication with the outside world? Like, how does the community support itself? The the boys and the men they they go out and work, you know, on construction jobs and stuff. But the women they're not allowed to go to work. They're just supposed to be home moms and take care of their kids and make meals and clean the house. You know that. So we all sewed. We're just supposed to stay home. No, but no women got to work. But yeah, the men went out and earned money and gave it to the church. Right. So as a as a woman who finds herself on the outside uh, and free, uh, how do you go about kind of establishing yourself? And it's very uh, hard, like, to get a job and everything because you're only taught to be a home mom. You know, it's it's a learning process, and I think that's what I've feel for the most is the single moms and the women who come out and don't even know have a clue how to support themselves or their kids yeah um did you have a a, a firm support group outside that to kind of not ra- really. rally to no not oh. really i mean it, i i had a lot of hard time i cried a lot i bet but but i it was still worth it to me to have my freedom but you know i I did violin lessons, and, and I'll tell you, I, I struggled. I did. I had a lot of struggles, but it slowly, slowly has come together, and it's gotten much better. Yeah. What was the, the thing on the outside that made you the happiest that you had uh, never gotten to do or always dreamed about doing? I don't know. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> because we didn't get to do anything. <laughs> Just buying clothes, um, eating what we wanted, um watching movies, reading books, everything. It was just all so new and fun. I can't really put my finger on one certain thing. It was just everything, just to be la- laugh and be happy, have a party, you know. All right. that was just so wonderful. Right. Um, so your new book, Breaking Free, is out today, How I Escaped Polygamy, the FLDS Cult, and my father, Warren Jeps. Um, why did you decide to write a book, Rachel? Um. As I said, I always like to write. I actually even started writing my story when I was still in the church. Not, I didn't dare when I started originally writing. I didn't dare write about the wrong things Father had done to me, because you know that would have never been accepted. But then after I left, and a lot of people came and started asking me about why I left and my story, then I thought, you know, I'll just write a book and they can read it. And so. Ever since I left, when people came and asked my story, I would just say, I'm writing a book. You can read it when I go. <laughs> and, and I just I just started working on it like within three months after I left. And I just believed that I would get a book deal somehow and it would work out. And I, I felt like it would help a lot of people that are in bad situations as well as in the FLDS church. And so it just gave me that determination to keep writing. Right. Right. Um, when you're when you're telling a story like this, and um, the you know the this happened to you, and and it's your whole life you were uh, in this church. Um, so when when you're writing the book, I've all, I'm always fascinated by memoirs and uh, and and people telling their own story. How do you decide where to begin, and uh, kind of what what was the story that you wanted to tell? Well, I felt like my whole life was was a result. Father controlled me as a result of what he had done to me. Like trying to keep that part of his life secret, he punished me and ran me 
according to a way to keep what he had done to me secret. And that's kind of why I decided to write about that because my whole life was a result of the abuse he did to me. And he kept me away from the family, you know, tried to keep me away so that I wouldn't tell anybody. I felt like my whole life was controlled by him because of this. I mean, he, it was he controlled everybody, but especially me. He didn't want my story to get out. And that's kind of why I... I mean, that was my life. That's why I decided to write about that. Right. Um, it's such an interesting situation because you've got layers of abuse. Uh, one, you've got a, a whole family and, and a whole church organization of, of people that are there against their will uh, and, mm-hmm. and people born into it like you were. You, you never knew any different. Um, but then you've got this other abuse, uh, and, and you say that, that the the other abuse that you talk about in the book and this uh, relationship with your father, uh, that this was even against his own teaching. Um, so even though it, it's an abusive situation and and almost a, a hostage situation in some cases, um, he still had certain morals that um, that he attempted to live by. Uh, but yep. then he he broke those own morals, you know, in this way. Um, uh, you know, when you're when you're thinking back and trying to make some sense of it in writing this book, um, what did you discover about your father uh, in the writing of this and trying to uncover his motivations that that maybe he, other people would be surprised by? He he is all in his mind. He is the exception. Everyone else in that church has to live perfect. I mean, they don't touch each other. They don't have kids. They don't even give each other a hug. They literally, I mean, you watch that person, you think, wow, they're so perfect in, in a sense. You know, they, they don't do one bad thing, supposedly, to, to say it's just ridiculous. But um, but he's the exception. He he can do anything he wants, you know. He's the exception, and, and no, no rules go for him. But everybody else has to live by the rules, but he doesn't. Um, how did how did the FLDS get founded? Like, uh, did 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 Warren found it himself, and and why w- would he break off from the mainstream church to, no, to go? No, do he this? didn't found it. Um, his so clear back. So the Mormon Church, you know, Joseph Smith taught polygamy. Brigham Young taught polygamy. He was the one after Joseph Smith. John Taylor was the one after him. And during John Taylor's time, then. Wilford Woodruff, the prophet, one of the one of the apostles in the church, supposedly got this revelation to stop polygamy, and so John Taylor told a whole group of men, "No, the Lord still wants us to live polygamy." And so all these men secretly lived polygamy. This is where the FLDS group started, and they lived in hiding for many years. And it wasn't till my grandfather was a young man that they actually came out and lived openly. So it really was founded clear back then. It just they were broke off that many years ago, and it was just secretly lived until about 1940s. Wow! So, so this was a situation that your father grew up in as well. Oh yes, yes, and then and then, but for some reason, he was just exceptionally different. I mean, it wasn't so bad back then. It, it's just when he took control. He, he, I don't know what's wrong with him. I don't know why he thinks the way he does. It's just really weird. Mm. Um, do you have any communication with the folks inside the FLDS now? I, I try because I want to help him leave, but, you know, he's told everyone there that I'm a terrible person and to not talk to me, so it's really hard to get anybody to talk to me. Right, right. Do you think anyone inside knows about the, the book? Um, maybe, perhaps, but I doubt it for the most part. You know, he wouldn't want them to know. Sure, sure. Wow. Uh, when's the last time you spoke with Warren? Um, a long time ago. I, I haven't personally talked to him since probably 2011, the one time I went and saw him in prison. Wow. Yeah, um, speaking of that, he's he's in prison now. Why Why is Warren in prison? Because, like I say, he's the exception, so he could have sex with little girls and stuff i mean he he did openly marry 12 13 14 year olds and 
the men that gave their daughters originally to him believed that he was not going to have sex with them until they were 18. They had no idea that he was actually raping them. They wow. thought he was too good because, like I say, the way he taught was opposite of the way he lived. Wow. And and so folks inside there see this going on, but they're just blinded to, to the obvious fact in front of their face. Yeah, they, they don't believe he has ever done wrong. They really don't because he teaches so opposite of what he has done. Wow. So he's in prison now. Is this organization still intact even though the leader is, is not there? Yes, because he runs the, the the church from prison, you know, through visits and letter writing. That is so bizarre. Like, <laughs> like, I know. Oh, it's it's so crazy. Um, uh, so how many folks have come out and gotten free from the FLDS? Quite a few lately. You know, people are getting sick of it, realizing it's really stupid. You know, kids haven't been born since 2010. There has nobody's been allowed to have any kind of marital relationships since then. People are getting sick of it and leaving slowly. Wow. That's... It, since 2010? Yep. Wow. Wow. Um, how many siblings do you have, Rachel? 53. 53. And how many of them are on the outside of the FLDS? Just seven of us have left. Wow. Um, are, are you guys close? Yep. Yep. We talk every day. We... We love each other a lot, and and we're all we're mostly all half siblings. <laughs> right, I, I I can imagine. Uh, how many wives did Warren have, or does Warren have? Seventy-eight. Good grief! Yeah, I, I would imagine lots of half siblings uh, for sure. <laughs> um, Rachel, this is an extremely powerful book. Uh, not only telling your story and uh the you know your your personal struggle and you know the the story of a girl uh with a uh with a distorted uh father daughter relationship uh because of the way you were brought up but also this this organization that that most of us can't even imagine you know what that's like um mm -hmm. but in the in the telling of the story and the publishing of the book uh have have you gotten feedback from other people that that maybe weren't in the flds but maybe were in similar situations with other groups um have, have oh, you yeah. have you seen that this book has really uh you know uh, allowed them to come to grips with their situation yeah, I've had a lot of people message me, like, on Facebook and stuff. Hey, Rachel, your story has given me strength to stand up and make my situation better. Or, or Rachel, I'm in a bad situation, and I know how you felt and stuff like that. Yeah, a lot of, pe lot of people have been, uh, messaged me about that. Yeah. Um, are you surprised uh, when you hear stories from other people that uh, – you know, that this sort of thing happens so often and kind of so scattered around the world? I guess I'm not really surprised with anything after living with father. I mean, I guess I guess I, I, I'm i sad that it happens so much, but I kind of realize that it really does happen. I mean, if it happened to me, I'm sure it happens to so many other people. And I think we need to stand up and talk about it so that, so that it can change. Yeah. Um, Rachel, how does, uh, when someone comes out of a situation like you did, um, I, I can only imagine the, the struggles, um, that you have with, not only with, um, uh, with relationships with people and, 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 and wanting to trust people and being very guarded, uh, but what about your faith? Like, how do you, how do you come to grips with, um, you know, what you were raised in and what you were taught and, and trying to find you know, uh, a faith of your own. Yeah, you know, growing up, I so quickly had to define the difference between my dad, Warren Jess, and God. They're two different people. God really was there. He really was there for me in so many ways, I felt like. Even in leaving, I felt like he has been there for me and in really hard situations and helped it be better. And so it it wasn't really hard for me to define that he was just a false prophet or whatever, trying to take control of people and that God was really there in my mind. And so I felt I, I am a Christian, but I don't follow religion. And it's really hard for me. You know, I've had lots of people try to convert me to their different religions. It's really hard to follow a man 
to get to God. I feel like, why not just talk to God myself instead of try and go through another man? I feel like so often men use religion to get control of people, and I don't know, it's just, I, I, I'm not, I don't like to really try and tell people my faith or belief because I don't, I feel like that has been pushed on me so much in my life. I just simply, I just feel like it's also simple. Just, I just pray to God and that's it. I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I believe in the Bible, but I don't really go further than that. I just, no, I don't follow any religion. Yeah, well, when it's uh, when you're you're born into a particular structure, um, and and your your the lines are blurred between your your faith life and your life life, and uh, it all is wrapped up. Uh, sometimes you just kind of have to step back and say, "I'm I'm going to have to figure this out for myself," you know. Yeah. And yeah. Um, thank you for your input, but uh, I'm going to figure this out for myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, how long did it take you to write this book? About, uh, uh, I started right after I left, but I didn't really stay, I, I mean, I didn't write every day. I wrote, you know, at least once a week, and then after about a year, then I started writing a lot more. I tried to write every day, and then after I got my book deal, then I finished, I had written at least half of it by the time I got my book deal, and then I finished writing, I wrote every day after that, for sure, until it was finished. It took me at least... A year, probably at least a year to get it all done. Did you get good in, input from your publisher on maybe how to what parts of the story would would be more impactful, or did they you just know, kind of let I, you tell I it? First, when I first started writing it, they're like, "Oh, don't you don't need to really write about the abuse. Let's write about polygamy and stuff." And I thought, you know what, I'm just going to write. I knew my whole story stemmed off of the abuse because I mean it wasn't just about the abuse but it really my life was a result of that abuse and so I just wrote it anyway and then they just took it and oh yeah that is the part they used you know I knew they would I knew that they'd realize after it all came together that it needed to be in there right right uh Rachel um thank you so much for for being so brave uh in the the writing of the book and the telling of your story and uh you're impacting a lot of people and giving people courage uh, thank you so much for for doing that and for taking time to come on the show today mm -hmm. um where can people find you if they want to follow along with what's uh, coming up next for you I have a Facebook page under my name Rachel Jeffs and I have a Twitter account um that's all. that's Rachel Jeffs too. So I I think that's the best way right now. I am trying to set up a website, but I haven't yet. Got you. All right, we're gonna put a link to uh, the new book, Breaking Free: How I Escaped Polygamy, the FLDS Cult, and my father Warren Jeffs. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to HankGarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. I found Absalom in the parlor by the fireplace. Irving had encouraged his guests to reenact the famous Van Tassel party of the legend and tell ghost stories. The brandy poured freely, the men smoked, and the chestnut tails of the region were trotted out one by one in parade. The White Lady of Raven Rock, the ghost of poor Major Andre, hanged from the tulip tree aside the post road and, of course, the headless horseman. Did you ride that night, Brom? asked young Joseph Martling. Was it you that affrighted the schoolteacher? Brom sat and all eyes were on him. Whatever the truth, I hope his son will forgive my part in it. There's nothing to forgive, said the son of Ichabod. It's a grand work, Mr. Irving, a grand fiction. On the mantel, a bronze clock chimed eleven. Tis almost the witching hour, said Irving. Time for all children to be abed, lest they be caught on the road. I would not be caught dead on the road tonight, said Martling, who lived nearby. Why not, said I. Let us ride Ichabod's route back to Beekmantown in commemoration. The young men cheered the idea. I turned to Absalom. Would you join us? No. 
It's absurd. The sleepy hollow boys jeered at him. Absalom sighed. Very well, then. We will ride together as a group. The gloom that found us on the road was terrible. In those days, no gas lights lit the post road, and the way from Roost to the bridge crossing still wound past Wildy Swamp, fearfully black at that hour. I watched Absalom riding to my left. He was a thin, spectral thing in the moonlight. Idle talk died on our lips, and our small band rode with only the sound of horse hooves for accompaniment. There it is, whispered Martling. The hanging tree. The old tulip tree twisted against the starry sky. The road broke to either side of it. That is where your father is said to have first seen the thing. My companion had slowed, gazing fearfully at the branches above. I saw something he whispered. I saw a body swinging from the tree. Come now, Absalom. You don't believe in ghosts, do you? Hurry up, then. Quick, before the horseman rides. You can't reason with a headless man. As if on cue, a wind rose. Branches tore and leaves swept the air. A terrible cracking laugh rose all around. Eyes opened and watched us from the deep. The faces of spirits appeared. Horrors rose from the Andre Brook. Our horses whinnied and reared. Absalom grabbed my arm and pointed. The horseman stood on the slope above. He raised his hatchet. His army of ghosts fell upon us. My horse and I turned circles, terrorized and confused. Young Martling shouted, We have to make the bridge! and rode off. Make the bridge! cried the others as one and our companions scattered, tearing up the post road with a clatter of frantic hooves. Make the bridge! The horseman gathered his form and lunged at Absalom. Young Crane dodged the blade, dug heels into the flanks of his steed, and fled. Cries of, Make the bridge! echoed all around. Where? cried Absalom, galloping into the swamp, his voice distant and small. Where is the bridge? Someone tell me! Help! He was gone before I could answer. Yet what could I have said? The bridge of legend is gone, torn down. It shall never be crossed again. I watched Absalom splash into Wildy Swamp, the horseman in pursuit. And I knew what his fate would be.